Now I have some bad news for you. We're not in America. We're in another country. Foreign currencies are collapsing against the dollar. This is the Argentine peso against the dollar. In 20 years, the peso goes from 1 to 500. The peso has lost 99.8% of its value against the dollar at the same time that the dollar has lost 75% of its value against the S&P index. I'll let you do the math. If you run a company in Argentina and you're going to work hard, you're going to have to grow your revenues from 1 million pesos to 500 million pesos over 20 years to stand still. And that's why I say no amount of hard work is going to solve the problem of being on the wrong side of an economic war. There's only one strategy here. You have to get out of that peso. You have to exit. This is the lira. This is before this week. It lost 95% of its value. Now the number is about 97% of its value against the dollar. This is the rupee. It's lost 90% of its value against the dollar. So that 99.8% loss is another 90%. So we're kind of running out of numbers to calculate just how much of your wealth has gone from you to the government. When the government actually collapses the currency 99.9%, .9%, what it means is over 100 years, they in essence take all of your wealth and they redistribute it to their cronies, to, to whoever they want. And that's the rate at which it's going. This is Pakistan, 82% against the dollar. This is the Brazilian real, 65% against the dollar. Conclusion, if you want to preserve your wealth, you have to convert that currency into an asset that's scarce, desirable, portable, durable, and maintainable, right? There, there are certain things that are scarce and desirable, but they don't move, like beachfront property. And by the way, maintainable, if you own a million dollars of property in Miami, you have to pay $20,000 a year, every year, to maintain it, and it gets, uh, it gets assessed up. So you have to have a million dollars to cover the taxes on a million dollars of property in Miami Beach over about 20 years. You can't maintain it. So you're going to be a smart investor. Here's smart investors, people bragging about making money in the stock market. The S&P index is going up 7 to 8% a year. And so you must be really smart. You invested in companies that are making good decisions. Look at the money supply. The money supply is going up at the same rate as the S&P index. And so what you begin to realize is most investment gains aren't really gains at all. All you're doing is simply tracking the monetary inflation rate if you're lucky. That's an excellent conclusion to have there. And I think that gets to a larger point that people don't even really understand why we accept political currency. Like, Why do people use dollars? Why do we use political currencies? It's because this is too expensive to transaction, okay? This gold coin preserves its purchasing power way more than the U.S. dollar. However, the difference is I can't send a $2 transaction. I, I'd have to literally cut this coin into a thousand pieces to buy a cup of coffee or to buy some tea here. You know, it, it's it's impossible. You know, but, uh, you know, basically you're having to barter like on some sort of credit system atop of the gold and the gold be the base chain, right? Even though this is better at preserving energy as a function of time, it's horrible at transacting energy across space. And that's why we accept the lie and the deceit and the manipulation of political currency because it's so much easier to use. And the net benefit and ease of use for us, either in our perception or reality, is worth the energy savings of not having to transact in a uh, you know harder form of money like that, right? And so you know it, it's unpopular, but political currencies are an innovation on previous forms of money, previous forms of currency. Obviously, there are many trade-offs to the downside there, but it is a form of technology. It's a technology. All forms of money are technology. And the technology of political currency basically says, hey, 
It's too expensive, as Michael says, to transact in Miami beachfront property. It's too expensive to transact in gold day to day. So us, the politicians, with our big armies and with our big, you know, our, our, our constitution and our paperwork, you know, with, with all the energy that we channel, we will create a, a numerical form of gold, right? So you have the real, the real forms of energy, right? That take that take that take energy to produce. Okay, we're going to create a numerical system backed by that, right? And then you can transact on that, and you don't have the extreme expense you're going to have with this, right? The problem though is that if I'm the guy that says they're backed one to one, who says they're backed one to one? I do. And who backs that? Oh, the full faith and credit, faith, faith, trust, and credit you have in me, right? You know, the problem is you have a massive incentive to instead then just replace instead of just represent. And that's exactly what happens, right? We're replacing gold with plastic. We're replacing things with extreme energy to produce extremely sound forms of money to extremely unsound forms of money. And the innovation, the innovation is to bring an extremely ease of use form of money with something that takes extreme amounts of energy to produce, combine it together into something that's actually gonna retain its purchasing power and actually be usable for people. Something that does not require a centralized point of political or human oversight to, uh, to guarantee its scarcity. Something like gold that is going to have its scarcity be extremely expensive to produce, but without the need for human oversight to manage that scarcity or to decree monetary policy. Something that can, that can on its own adjust to the changing economy, adjust to the changing world, and adjust to the changing dynamics of a free market and be that store of value as a finite and, and absolute numerical system, a finite ledger pricing in a perpetually, perpetually more infinite world. Now let's talk about all the assets. Okay, this is a, this is a 30 year or 20 year return on asset classes compiled by JP Morgan. On the far right, you see commodities, they're awful. Commodities are silver, gold, natural gas, especially oil, soybeans, lumber, pork bellies. Why are commodities awful? Because humans are really good at trading more of them, and they will drive the price down using technology, ingenuity, and capital. Commodities lose you money. Cash, also pretty awful. Now, you see the inflation rate? that the largest bank in the United States marks, they mark it at 2%. That's what the government tells you their inflation rate target is, 2%. That's their consumer inflation rate. That's fake, right? Every single 10 years or every few years, I'll just redefine the market basket of goods and I'm gonna put drywall and manufactured biscuits and Netflix videos and something cheap. You can be sure I take the expensive stuff and I move it out of the consumer basket and I take cheap stuff and I put it in the consumer basket and you're moving toward a world where you live in a 300 square foot apartment constructed of drywall sitting on a cheap rickety plastic chair with a set of goggles on while you're imagining yourself in a beautiful universe with a bunch of digital stuff and you'll get digital healthcare and you'll get digital entertainment, and you'll have digital friends, and you'll take digital trips to digital vacation destinations in your digital jet, and everything will be good. That's the problem with the CPI. Now, look at the S&P index, right? You feel like you're a genius if you're getting 7.5% against that. But what if I told you the real inflation rate of the US dollar over a hundred years is about seven and a half to eight percent. That's the actual inflation. Now you see the average investor is getting 2.9 percent when they're smart. Commodities are less. The S&P is underperforming the inflation rate. Look in the far left. What's your best chance? It's called a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. If you have a property company and you buy the scarce desirable real estate in the middle of London or New York, and if you can generate a yield on it, and if you're really good at it, you might be able to just barely keep your head above water. But you know, none of these look all that compelling, right? I mean, investment consists of either losing your money fast or losing your money slow 
or, or after a hundred years of brilliance, assuming that the government doesn't fail and you don't have your assets seized. And I didn't include taxes. As long as you don't die, you don't have any capital gains, and you don't have any inheritance tax, you might barely just keep what you had a hundred years ago in this world. A lot of people think that we're conspiracy theorists. A lot of people would say what Michael just said is conspiracy theory, that, oh, we're all moving towards a more and more dystopian world. We're all, we're all going to get plugged into some sort of dystopian thing. But I really want to emphasize that it has to get worse. Okay, You have political currency, a system reliant on trust that is not backed one-to-one. -one. Inherently, there can be no trust. Okay, It is not sound. And so therefore, in order for it to survive, and with it to survive in the face of an exponentially decaying amount of trust, it requires an exponentially increasing amount of manipulation of information, an amount of manipulation of information of truth, and a slow debasement of energy. It is not accidental, it is not coincidental, and it cannot be reversed. It is inevitable, okay? To, to, re to restate what Michael's saying here in a slightly different way is this. The way to think about it is that Money is information. The information is not correct. And so the only way to have all of society still go along with the political currency, even though it's not sound, even though it's not information that is no longer one plus one equaling two, the only way to have is to manipulate information everywhere else. And that's what you know Michael's talking about here with the CPI basket, right? It's not conspiracy theory to say that the government is going to change the basket of goods in someone's lifestyle to have a better cpi print that's literally what has to happen and if you don't do it someone else is going to do it for you right every individual has their own inflation rate i am here in the united states of america i have a very different inflation rate than someone down the street i have an entirely different inflation rate than someone three blocks over i have an even more dramatically different inflation rate than a person across the planet right every single individual has their own needs their own desires their own mixed basket of personal goods and the government picking an arbitrary basket of goods they're obviously going to pick the lowest ones they're obviously going to pick the ones that give the perception of the slowest rate of death of their political currency okay and that's really important to keep in mind that as those things change in that basket right in the same way that we've swung from gold to equities and we may swing back to gold you know in the same way as that example before we will swing different assets at different times. And so the government will always add or subtract from their CPI prints what, what the real basket of goods is this time, right? You know, here in America, we've had higher than normal inflation since 2020, okay? The actual inflation rate's been much higher. And people wonder, you know, they say inflation's 8%, but I go to the store and the price of this is doubled or the price of that. So more like a third or double, you know, or, or up by 50% or quadruple, you know, everything's changing at different inflation rates because everything has a changing amount of scarcity, a changing amount of demand, and the currency at which we're pricing those things in is also having a radically changing amount of supply and demand. And so the point here is that if you're trying to communicate to people in that political problem, they don't understand that it's, uh, they don't understand it's a political problem, they're going to have a hard time understanding that there's no political solution. It has to get worse. Like, th there is no way that a political problem is going to willingly or forcefully create a political solution to solve that political problem, right? You have the layer two politics atop of energy. There's a disparity between the two, and that you're not, you're not going to have them realign. The only possible fix is to have from the bottom up, okay, from the bottom up, re reform everything, right? In the same way that the birds... Uh, you know, if, the, if we think of the feathers or the dance that they do as the layer two to the energy being the calories they have, you can't fix the politics until you fix the energy because the whole industry, and I will call it industry, the whole industry of politics is about channeling energy. And so if it's not back to one to one, it has to decline. It has to get worse. And that is the point that Michael is pointing out here, that if you're trying to solve a political problem from within a political system, that it's just going to continue to decline. And as Michael said earlier, you know, this is the best it gets. Okay, we have been in the most prosperous time of the most prosperous nation in the planet, the last few decades of the United States of America. And unfortunately, we're having a lot of things change. And that really needs to be kept in mind. And that's why Bitcoin is so important to consider. Most investors, they just perform poorly because of bad habits. What kind of bad habits? 
This is a 30-year chart of returns on the S&P index. And this chart tells you that if you missed one day, there's one day every year when 85%, 90% of all of the gains come. One day. And there are 36 hours a year when all investment return takes place. So in 365 days, nothing happens 99.5% of the time. This is why we have the laser eyes. This is why we say HODL. Because, and I have said before, trading Bitcoin is a sign of lesser intellect. If I were to say 1% of the days you could trade successfully, I would be overstating your odds of success. You literally have to find the 24 hours out of 365 days when the market moves, and you will be wrong 99 plus percent of the time if you trade. It's, you're going to sit here and Bitcoin's going to be whatever it's going to be, and then one day you're going to wake up and it's going to double. And if you miss that day, you're going to be kicking yourself. Hoddle. Don't trade. Most people destroy themselves by thinking that they actually can time the market. This is a chart as of about a month ago. And what it shows is year to date, 1% of the companies in the S&P index had all the gain. If you look at this chart this week, the number for... There are 493 companies in the S&P index that have collectively 0% return. And there are seven that have 50% return. And another way to say that is 99% of the companies cannot keep up with inflation. You think you're going to pick stocks? You're going to pick the winner? There's a 99% chance you won't. And maybe there's a bigger idea here, which is if you have one of the greatest companies in, in the world, there's a 99% chance after 100 years of being great, you still can't keep up with inflation. And this is why I say maybe your hard work doesn't matter as much as government policy matters. You're, you're not going to find the winner 99% of the time. And... Uh, you remember I've said before, diversification, it's selling the winner to buy the loser. Right? All these really brilliant investors that diversify, they're basic, if they're smart enough to buy Apple or Amazon, when they diversify, they go from 44% return to 10% return. And if you manage to like get it right, you may be the 0% return. That is extremely controversial to people that are not in Bitcoin. They're like, oh, diversification is bad. What are you talking about? Diversification is important. You know, my financial advisor says diversification is important. You know, just intuitively diversification makes important. I don't know the future. Why should I be so arrogant and, and so overconfident to be all in on something when I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Good point. Now, to give some more context, you know, to that point that you're saying that's very valid and to what Michael is saying here, the point is... In the modern world, our money is not attached. Our political currency is not attached to something with real energy to create. We can just create more zeros, right? Granted, we sometimes create zeros a little slower than other times, but we're always going to create more political currency. And so you have to own something for your retirement, for your kids, for your future, something that's going to hold its purchasing power over time. Michael just made that point very well. And when you don't know the future of that complicated world of the macroeconomic you don't know what wars are going to start you don't know what trade routes are going to be created or destroyed you don't know what's going to change in the world you don't know what innovations are going to happen you don't know what companies are going to go bust and so the only way to operate in a world without money that takes energy to survive is to diversify into a mixed basket of goods that do require energy to produce and save in that right now in the modern world in 2024 we do that in a few different ways one way is gold one way is real estate another is bonds and another is corporate stock right corporate stock 
takes energy to produce. Yes, it's ones and zeros, but it's backed at least a little more directly uh, to corporate energy. You're, you're, you're backed by the earnings of that stock, right? Price to earnings ratio, PE ratio, right? Gold obviously takes energy because you have to mine it out of the ground. Obviously it takes energy to produce. Real estate takes time to build. Diamonds you have to either create or, or, or dig out of the ground, right? Same with silver, uh, same with everything else, right? Bonds also, you know, I won't get into bonds, but the point is all of these things take energy to produce. And because you don't have any form of money, you're creating a mixed basket of things that do require energy. You're trying to recreate this. That's what you're trying to do. This, this world in the early 21st century where people diversified a mixed basket portfolio of commodities and equities and corporate, you know, or, or government debt. We, we diversify in that because we're trying to recreate money in a digital form. We don't want to save our life savings in gold because number one, like I said before, it's hard to transact. And number two, you have a single point of failure. If I'm storing this gold in my house safe and you break in my house, you get the gold, right? Which is why I don't really hold gold long-term and I'm getting rid of this coin pretty soon. But that's the point, that if you hold analog money that does create that does have energy backing it, you have a single point of failure that is you in your house, right? And likewise, when you have this form of digital money, that, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create a digital money by having a diversified portfolio. And the hope is that the overall returns of that sound or more sound form of digital proxy money by having a diversified portfolio of goods is going to save your energy better than the government created currency that is not just ones and zeros out of thing out of the thing made out of plastic, right? That's the point. That's why we have these portfolios. And that's why the importance of these portfolios has exploded in value over the last 80, 90, 100 years, right? The inflation rate after 1971, when we detached from gold, has become much higher than it was in the 19th century and the early 20th century, even in the United States, right? That's why these investing things have become so important. It's why everyone, especially the last 20 years, has become so focused about trading, about flipping, about these finance gurus and all that. It's because it's becoming increasingly important to create a digital proxy money with a diversified portfolio of various assets that take energy to produce in a world with the context that the predominant form of digital money is political money is declining and dying and having less energy backing it every single year or having less energy being able to be exchanged for it every single year. And so the point, the point is, yes, diversification makes perfect sense in a world where you don't have Bitcoin. In a world with Bitcoin, diversifying out of it does not make sense. And the reason is because that diversified portfolio of things that take energy to produce, you're basically trying to get an index for the world, right? What's the best you can do? Okay, the biggest government in the world, the biggest country, you know, biggest economy in the world, United States. Okay, let's get American debt. Okay, maybe we get some international debt too. Okay, equities. Let's get the broad index of, of America's stock market, right? Maybe some international stock too. Let's get the broadest index of the world human productivity we possibly can. And that is our form of digital money that then we price in forms of political money. That diversification makes sense. But Bitcoin comes in and Bitcoin says, I not only have that much diversification, I have more diversification because I can onboard the hundreds of millions of billions of people that are not banked like you spoiled rich Westerners, okay? I am 24 seven, 365 days a year. No one controls me, all energy. I am the backing of it, right? That's basically what Bitcoin's trying to be. Basically, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Dow Jones are trying to index American corporate innovation and productivity. Bitcoin is trying to index the entire globe's worth of productivity. You know, so Bitcoin's actually more of, of that, right? And so the point is that in a world without Bitcoin, diversification makes sense. But Bitcoin is a thing of itself intended to destroy diversification, right? Because that is what you're trying to do with your portfolio. You're trying to create a digital money. Bitcoin is the digital money. And so you no longer have a need for the diversified portfolio of proxy digital finite money, right? It's the same thing with the horse and the locomotive, right? The horse makes perfect sense. The horse is the perfect thing to do in a world where biological means are your form of transportation, right? You don't walk. You don't ride a camel, you ride a horse if you really want to get somewhere. But in a world with a locomotive, in the world with coal and fire and steam, 
the horse no longer makes sense. Again, it's a technological change. Political currency is a technology. Bitcoin is a new technology. And the innovation, right? People wonder, well, Bitcoin's not faster or cheaper. Why is it better? It's because it's a scarcity and because of its properties. It is that. It is the removal of the need for diversification in and of itself. And so hopefully that context uh, makes a bit more sense. And to that point, in regards to Michael's earlier point about trading, you do not trade that. Are you going to trade the index for human productivity and human prosperity? Are you going to go short humanity? Oh, I think humanity's got a less bright future. I don't think, you know, I, I'm going to go buy gold, right? Because I am going to go out there and make the, with my own capital, I'm going to go out there and buy gold and hoard it because I think that humans aren't productive enough. They aren't ingenious enough and they aren't innovating technology enough that they're going to dig more of this out of the ground. They're not going to dig more of this out of the ground. They're not going to increase supply. That's what you do when you buy any of the assets within that ancient world diversified portfolio. If you're buying houses, you are taking a bet. I don't think humans are innovative enough, have enough um, ingenuity to build more housing. I'm going to go buy oil because I don't think humans are going to go dig more oil out of the ground and dump more supply in the market. I'm going to go buy diamonds. I'm going to go buy gold. I'm going to go buy corporate equity. In a world where you don't have finite absolute digital scarcity, that makes perfect sense. It's the best you can do. They're the things we can create the slowest. We can innovate and create gold, <laughs> innovate and create gold much slower than we can create and innovate new political currency, just ones and zeros out of thin air, right? But again, Bitcoin changes that fundamental understanding. And that's unfortunate. Most people, especially in the finance world, don't understand about Bitcoin. I think this is why engineers like Michael Saylor, by the way, engineering background at MIT, it's what the engineers understand from an energy first principle, right? The majority of this whole video so far, my and Ann Saylor's presentation I'm reacting to have to do with energy, right? It's not from a portfolio theory finance perspective. It's from that energy perspective. Again, he started his conversation out with there is an economic war. And so if you're going to try to time that, to trade that, I wish you good luck. But as Saylor said, less than 1% of the time in Bitcoin is when the market reprices, right? Because humans are extremely emotional, because information around the planet changes extremely quickly. And what's going to happen is that pricing something that takes energy to produce in terms of a political currency system designed to exponentially decay every single year is going to get harder and harder to do. A lot of people outside of Bitcoin that hear that, oh, wow, Bitcoin, or, or excuse me, Luke is a Bitcoin or wow, it makes YouTube. How, Luke, how's your Bitcoin trading going? Luke, how's your, you know, Bitcoin portfolio? You know, people outside don't understand because they're not, again, they're looking at it from a political lens, right? People think I'm trading Bitcoin. I'm not trading Bitcoin. I don't leverage trade Bitcoin. I don't day trade Bitcoin. I don't swing trade Bitcoin. I don't anything trade Bitcoin. I buy Bitcoin and I hold it, right? I would not trade gold. I would not trade diamonds. So why on earth would I trade Bitcoin? My encouragement to you, and I'm going to make this point really clear, is with Bitcoin, I encourage you, number one, learn about Bitcoin and buy some. Number two, take self-custody and don't have single points of failure. Don't store all your gold under your mattress at home, right? You know, you're tra transferring a single point of failure from someone else to yourself, right? And that does have a variety of risks. Because the point is, once you understand that, that the main risk is not having Bitcoin, and then once you have it, how are you storing it? You realize, why on earth would I trade it for any other inferior asset, right? And the internet, the big winners for the internet were the people that innovated solutions to monetize the global communications layer of the world, the internet, right? Amazon, Apple. Facebook, Google, they were the big winners. Okay, the way to win financially in the first part of the 21st century up to now was to buy a portion of the internet's monetizable arms. Okay, not trading. Yeah, maybe you could have made money trading. Yeah, maybe you could have money doing this and that. Whatever. The big way to win is buy that, right? The way you can think of Google, the way you can think of Netflix, the way you can think of Amazon, the way to think of them is that they're like layer two shares of the internet. The single best trade you could have made at the turn of the century, from the 20th into the 21st century, the single best trade you could have made was buying a portion of the internet. Now, that's not possible. You couldn't have done that. you know. But that would have been the better trade to make. What is the better buy than Google? What is the better buy than Amazon? The better buy is an actual share of the internet. Because Google might go bankrupt, Amazon might fade away but the internet itself is not going anywhere. And that's basically what Bitcoin is. 
except you're not buying a share of the productivity, ingenuity, innovation of the internet. You're buying that of the whole planet. And that is the opportunity of Bitcoin. It's not that, oh, Bitcoin is going to get you rich quick and you can trade it and sell it, make it for a big fiat profit. It's like, no, Bitcoin is the numerical system pricing in perpetual increased energy for the human race. Hey there, if you're considering going to a Bitcoin conference, I highly encourage you to consider Prague in June of 2024. There are lots of great Bitcoin conferences out there, but this one in Prague is one of the largest ones of them all. And there are a lot of amazing things with this conference uniquely that I think you should potentially consider. Um, I did not go last year in full transparency, but it was only their first year and they had an incredible lineup. Uh, Michael Saylor was there, Adam Back was there, Robert Breedlove, uh, Stefan Libera, you know, many people were there that I felt a lot of FOMO, frankly, I wished I was there. And so I'm very grateful to say that I reached out to the Prague uh, team and I said, hey, I wanted to go to your conference last year. I didn't. I don't want to make that mistake this year. And so I am going. Very grateful to say that I am going to uh, the Prague conference in June of 2024. So if you want to meet me, if you want to meet all the other Bitcoin speakers there, and again, they have a really great lineup coming, a lot of things they haven't even announced yet. But it's a really good opportunity. Yes, if you're in America, where you might be watching this, it's a longer flight over there, a bit more expensive travel to get there. But once you're there, you're in Europe and things are much cheaper uh, than they are in the U.S., uh, at least in Prague. So that's something really keep in mind that it's probably a lot more realistic than you think. And I think it's going to be a really low noise and really high signal conference. So if you want a good place to go, consider going there. Uh, I am offering, you know, a discount code for for there, right? I am speaking there, so I do have a discount code. Uh, you can get 10% off. Actually, you can get 15% off if you pay in Bitcoin. But even if you pay in fiat, you can get 10% off. So click the link in the description. You can get 10% off your ticket. If you're going anyway, you might as well use the code. And hopefully I'll see you there. I would love to see you uh, there and meet you before or after, uh, you know, the conference or whatever. So comment down below if you're going or not. I would love to meet uh, you. Yeah, so put the link, uh, link in the description. Click on that to buy your ticket. And uh, comment down below if you're going and would love to meet up. So thanks.